Okay, chapter nine of Hudson Taylor, Deep in the Heart of China by Jeff and Janet Bangi. Chapter nine is titled, If Only They Knew of the Living God. Hudson walked out of the compound gates and headed towards the Huangpu River. Dr. Lockhart's servant followed him at a distance, but eager as he was to reach the consulate office, Hudson couldn't help stopping along the way. Everything fascinated him. Shanghai was so different from London. Certainly London was busy, but Shanghai seemed so much busier. Even though the city was under siege, everywhere he looked, there was activity. By the side of the muddy road was an old man making lanterns from red paper. Two boys were selling brightly colored birds in bamboo cages. Another man was selling oval-shaped green fruit, unlike anything Hudson had seen before. A woman nursing a baby squatted beside a grass mat with cups of cooked rice arranged on it. Anyone who wasn't selling something seemed to be carrying something. As at the dock the day before, men were weaving in and out of the crowd, balancing bamboo poles across their shoulders. One man scurried by with live roosters tied by their feet, dangling from his pole. Another man had embroidered silk pillows tied to his. Young men also went by pushing wheelbarrows loaded with huge clay pots filled with water. Everywhere was the sound of people talking, laughing, and bartering. The air was also filled with interesting smells. The smell of food cooking in large walks over open fires, of live pigs and chickens and ducks, of the fragrant incense sold by merchants, and of the open sewers that ran alongside the street. The smells hung in the air, at times making Hudson want to breathe deeply to savor them, and at other times causing him to gag. As he walked along, he wondered how he could describe the scene in his next letter to Amelia. The only thing he could think to compare it with was their visit to the Great Exhibition in London two years ago, but how orderly that had been compared to this. Every few yards, he stopped to examine something for sale or to peer through a gate, but he was also eager to get the letter of credit from the Chinese Evangelization Society, along with his instructions on where and how to proceed in setting up the mission in Shanghai. He thought the first thing they would want him to do would be to find somewhere permanent to live while he prepared to go into the heart of China. The British consulate loomed in front of him once again. He climbed the steps of the consulate and entered, glancing behind at Dr. Lockhart's servant, who was waiting on the bottom step. How nice it felt to be able to read all the signs and charts and to know he spoke the same language as every other person in the room. There was a line at the mail counter, and Hudson found himself waiting behind a woman in a long hooped dress that pinched in at her waist. Her dress would have been perfectly normal in London, but in Shanghai it looked strangely out of place and impractical for the crowded, muddy streets. Finally, it was Hudson's turn to collect his mail. He said his name clearly and held out his hands, ready for the pile of letters. The clerk handed him only one letter. Hudson immediately recognized the handwriting on the envelope as his mother's. He waited for more letters, but instead of handing him more letters, the clerk said to him, two shillings, please, there is insufficient postage on this letter. You owe the difference. Hudson reached into his po jacket pocket and handed two shillings to the clerk, who entered the amount in a ledger stamped paid beside it. Still, Hudson waited patiently for more letters. The clerk looked puzzled. That's it, sir, he said before addressing the man standing in line behind him. Hudson moved away from the mail counter with the words, that's it, sir, ringing in his ears. That wasn't it. There was only one letter. The Burdones had told him a mail te steamer came from England every month. They were much faster at making the trip from England than a sailing ship like the Dumfries. So how could it be that there was only one letter and it wasn't from the Chinese Evangelization Society? Where was, where was their letter of credit? He needed that letter and he needed it now. What did they expect him to do in China with no money and no instructions on how to proceed? A second thought flashed through his mind. How do I keep the fact that I received no letter of credit from the other missionaries? After only one night at the London Missionary Society compound, Hudson could sense that the other missionaries thought the Chinese Evangelization Society was a joke. What would they think when they found out that the society had left him without money or instructions on what they wanted him to do? Hudson was still stunned as he left the British consulate and headed to the docks. The fog had cleared and the sight of the Dumfries sailing up the river cheered him up. It had been only a day, but it seemed like such a long time since he had seen Captain Morris.
The Dumfries docked amid much yelling and arm waving. As soon as the pilot disembarked, Hudson was allowed aboard. Captain Morris was glad to see him and gave him a hearty handshake. Then he ordered the crew to lower Hudson's baggage onto the dock. Hudson was grateful that Dr. Lockhart had sent along his servants with the instructions to help him get his belongings back to the compound. There was no way he could have made himself understood to the laborers, or coolies as they were called, who hung around the dock. Dr. Lockhart's servant quickly hired seven coolies to transport Hudson's belongings to the compound. They busily tied his things to, to ropes, then suspended them from bamboo poles. The first coolie had Hudson's harmonium dangling on one end of his pole, balanced by several bundles of books on the other. Two of the other coolies had looped a rope through the handles of his sea chest and carried it suspended on a bamboo pole between them. The chest bounced up and down as they walked. Hudson led the procession of coolies through the streets back to the compound. As they moved along, they blended in with the clatter of activity going on around them. It took Hudson only an afternoon to unpack his belongings and arrange them in his room. Unfortunately, his spare pair of shoes had been drenched on the voyage, probably when the hatch cover gave way during the storm in the Irish Sea, and so he had to discard them. He also had to discard a pile of his Bible study notes. Several ink bottles had broken and doused the pages in black ink so that they couldn't be read. As he unpacked, he had plenty of time to think about what he should do next. He read his mother's letter over and over, hoping it would somehow give him an answer, but it didn't. By Sunday afternoon, he was getting restless. No new mail steamers had arrived, and he was not sleeping well. The crash of cannonballs hitting their target was keeping him awake at night. So it was a great relief when Alexander Wiley, the London Missionary Society printer, offered to take Hudson on a tour of the old walled city. The old city was surrounded on three sides by 50,000 troops from the Imperial Army. On the fourth side lay the International Settlement. As they walked through the busy streets of the International Settlement towards the old city, Alexander Wiley explained that because of the Treaty of Nanking, the Imperial Army had no power over the International Settlement. They couldn't surround it or harm it in any way. The situation greatly frustrated the army because some foreigners, hoping to see them defeated, were helping the red turbans inside the old city. They were supplying them with food, armaments, and anything else that might give them an edge over the imperial troops. With the rebels and the residents of old Shanghai receiving supplies and information about troop movements from foreigners, the siege could go on indefinitely. So naturally, the Imperial Army resented interfering foreigners. As they stopped under the shade of a flowering plum tree for a rest, Hudson asked Alexander Wiley how the missionaries felt about the siege. Wiley told him that the situation was a problem for missionaries. Missionaries tended to know the various Chinese dialects better than any other foreigners, and so were constantly being asked to spy for both sides. Some did, while others acted as official translators. It is impossible not to be moved by the plight of starving people inside the old city. Yet everyone knew that giving them aid only kept the war going longer. There was no easy answers to the situation for the missionaries living in the international settlement. The two men made their way along the edge of a canal that led up to the walled city. The south gate was closed, and so they began walking around the outside of the wall. Two minutes later, they saw a, laid a ladder that had been hung over the wall. After you, said Alexander Wiley, gesturing for Hudson to climb the ladder. Hudson grasped the bamboo and rope ladder with both hands and began to climb. At the top, he gazed down at the scene on the other side of the wall. As far as he could see, there were houses with their roofs either missing or damaged or with gaping holes in their walls. Some houses had simply been reduced to piles of charred wood and crumbled brick. Even the dirt streets had holes blown into them. In the middle of it all, people wandered around aimlessly. Hudson trembled as he climbed over the wall and down the ladder on the other side. It was one thing to hear the noise of war. It was quite another to see its destruction. Alexander Wiley followed closely behind. The scene did not seem to bother him. Hudson supposed today seemed, more des seemed no more desperate to him than any other day. Together, they began walking in the direction of a Buddhist temple. Along the way, Wiley and Hudson gave out tracts. As they did so, Hudson prayed silently that they would be read before they were burned as fuel or wadded together to fill a hole in a wall. Alexander Wiley stopped often to talk with people, and Hudson envied the way he was able to slip from English to Chinese and back again. 
Eventually, they reached the Buddhist temple where the yellow-robed priest greeted them. Inside the temple, Hudson could see men and women burning incense and praying to a large stone statue of Buddha. Hudson watched intently. In all his life, he had never seen anything other than a Christian church. And what struck him as he viewed the scene was not how different a Buddhist temple was from a Christian church, but the sincerity with which they worshipped. The worshippers worshipped a stone statue. If only they knew of the living God, he thought. Still thinking about the Buddhist worshippers, Hudson followed Alexander Wiley to the north gate. As they got nearer to the gate, they could hear shouting and screaming. Some kind of fight was in progress. Wiley put his hand out and stopped Hudson. It would be dangerous to go any closer to the fighting, he explained. But even if they did not go closer to the fighting, the results of the fighting were parading were paraded right past them as maimed and dead bodies were dragged away. It was a relief to Hudson when they finally approached a London Missionary Society chapel and heard singing. They slipped quietly into the back of the chapel where Dr. Medhurst had just begun to preach a sermon. Hudson concentrated hard on Dr. Medhurst's Chinese. It was so hard to pick out individual words as the sounds flowed together in what sounded more like singing than speaking. He looked around the chapel. One of its walls had a hole blown in it by a cannonball, and a pile of smashed chairs lay beside the hole. After the service, the man talked with Dr. Medhurst. The men talked with Dr. Medhurst, who agreed to meet them at the north gate in half an hour. Dr. Medhurst had some errands to run, and Alexander Wiley wanted to show Hudson some back streets near the chapel. They had walked a quarter of a mile when a group of yelling men with red turbans came into view. As they got closer, Hudson could see that they were pushing a small cannon. From the satisfied looks on their faces, he guessed they had just captured it from the Imperial Army. Behind them were five men, kicking and screaming, being dragged by their cues. It was plain from their uniforms they wore that they were Imperial Army soldiers. As soon as they saw Hudson and Alexander Wiley, they grabbed at their clothes. One of them got a hold of Hudson's trousers, but a red turban roughly jerked him away. Hudson did not need to understand their words to know they were begging for help. The pleading look in their eyes said it all. The two missionaries stood helpless as the group rounded a corner and disappeared from sight. There was nothing they could do for the men in the face of such a mob. Hudson asked Alexander Wiley what would happen to them. Wiley explained that they were captured soldiers on their way to be beheaded. He told Hudson that it was the most feared death a Chinese person could face because they believed that a person entered the afterlife without a head, he would have to live for eternity without him, without one. That was why it was so hard to get a Chinese person to agree to an amputation, he added. Hudson was still trying to put the picture of the pleading man out of his mind when they found a trail of fresh blood right where they had agreed to meet Dr. Medhurst. Fearing the worst, they followed the trail back to the international settlement Thankfully, Dr. Medhurst was unhurt, but he had quite a story to tell. While waiting for Hudson and Alexander Wiley, he had begun talking with two coolies. He heard cannon fire and so decided it would be best to walk on alone. He had walked about 10 feet when a cannonball whistled over overhead and landed right where he had been standing. The two coolies had their ankles smashed. Blood flowed from their legs as they were hurried to the hospital, explaining the trail of blood. The only hope of survival for either coolie was to amputate his legs, which they had both refused. All that could be done now was to make them comfortable as they awaited certain death. The missionaries arrived back at the London Missionary Society compound, and Hudson went to his room, sobered by all he had seen. How different it all was from Sunday afternoons in England. He had prepared himself for many things in coming to China, but not for being in the middle of a war. Worst of all, in the midst of all the suffering he had seen, he felt useless. Inside the old city, men, women, and children were praying at shrines to their ancestors and stone idols, while he had the knowledge of the true and living God, who could really answer their prayers. His heart burned to tell these people about God's love, but he didn't know how to speak a word of Chinese. If he was going to fill his, fulfill his burning desire to share the gospel with the people of China, he was going to have to learn Chinese and learn it fast. The following morning, Dr. Medhurst suggested that Hudson start learning the Mandarin dialect of Chinese rather than the local dialect spoken around Shanghai. He explained that a Mandarin was a government-appointed leader and magistrate. Every city had one, and it was his job to settle problems and rule the people according to the instructions he received from the emperor. It had been that way in China for many centuries, and it meant that a country as large as China was 
uh, as large as China was, could be ruled quite efficiently. The Mandarins, as well as the people of learning and many merchants in the country, spoke a dialect known as Mandarin. No matter what province they were from, they could all understand and talk to each other, and the emperor could easily communicate to the Mandarins how he wanted them to rule. Hudson could see the wisdom of Dr. Medher's suggestion. By learning the Mandarin dialect, he would be able to communicate with people wherever he went, even deep in the heart of China. Dr. Methurst arranged for a tutor to teach Hudson Mandarin, so each morning the tutor and Hudson spent several hours studying the dialect. Hudson proved to be a fast learner, and much to everyone's surprise, it wasn't long before he was going to the market on his own and bartering in Mandarin with the merchants over the price of his purchases. Dr. Methurst could see a lot of promise in Hudson as a doctor, and since it seemed to him that the Chinese Evangelization Society had no real plan for him, he invited Hudson to continue his medical studies at the London Missionary Society Hospital. Hudson accepted the invitation, and soon his days were divided between learning the Mandarin dialect and caring for patients at the hospital. He was busy, yes, but still not fulfilled. He was in China, but only on the coastal plain. He wanted to be moving inland. But first he needed money and instructions from the Chinese Evangelization Society. Why was it taking them so long?